Welcome to our event today. It's, it's National Craft Month. So we are working on some projects that are the fun kind. We don't have to think as much. We can use those things we probably have in our stash, in the um, in our studios, in the closet, in bins, and pull it out and use it up and make something really fabulous. So if you haven't already, go in and download the pattern. Yours will have um, banners across it, letting you know that it's coming from um, our platform Craftsy or National Qu Sewing Circle, National Quilter Circle. We are all together today having fun making a project. So I'm billing this as the stash party, but it can be a baby quilt. It could be a lap quilt for an adult. It could be a picnic blanket. It could be the car quilt that, you know, you're always thinking, where, where can I put a quilt? <laughs> or how can I gift this maybe? Um, it could be a birthday gift, an anniversary retirement gift. This is a project that really spans a wide range and it's quick to make. So get that pattern, download it. Um, if you are going to download it later, grab something just to make some notations because um, what we like to do here is give the tips and tricks so that you have great success in creating the blocks and putting together your project. So do that, get something to write with or, or something that you can type notes into. I know some people are more electronic, so they're, they may be using a tablet or something to take their notes on, but grab that so that you can have, uh, have some fun with us today doing our Stash Buster project. Always remember that the comment section, if you have questions, if I go you know, through something too quickly, or if I use a product you're not um, so familiar with, you know, type into the comments, then they get conveyed to me and we can stop back up and I can explain further because I hate to lose someone on the journey. The idea is that we all have fun together. So, and let us know where you're watching from. It's always fun to see how broad and net our platforms um, interact with people around the world. So thanks for being here. The stash party uh, project was one that they asked, can you come up with something to use up strips? And I'm thinking, I've got strips left over from so many projects. I, I never throw away the end of bindings because they're two and a half inch wide usually. Um, there's always leftover pieces from every kit you buy, or if you buy yardage on your own to do a project, you always buy just a little bit more in case you make a mistake. Well you can easily cut two and a half inch strips out of that. So our project today, of course, then uses up those two and a half inch strips, or you can go in and intentionally cut strips out of things that you like. I decided to go kind of in the primary bright. It's been very gray where I live in Iowa. So I needed something to bring some color into my studio and bring a little sunshine. So all of my strips were really bright in the primaries. I kind of did a tonal thing. I didn't include too many prints in mine. I mean, they're prints, but they're very subtle prints. But you could dig into a stash of everything blue and have a light color or a gray or something as your background piece and then do all blues to one side. Um, there are so many ways to attack this project that um, primaries are just happened to be the, the um, direction that I decided to take. And... A friend of mine years ago had done a project that had some black and white stripe in it. And I've always wanted to do something with that. Using a black and white stripe is kind of that offset jump for um, up against a lot of bright colors. And so the um, primaries that I use here with that black and white stripe and a little bit narrower, I know that it reads a little gray if you step back too far. But if I put it up to the camera, you can see that definitely a really strong black and white stripe. If you use too wide, it tends to vibrate our eyes. Um, just a little kind of just gives a kick of fun in between the blocks. So I chose that black and white stripe um, for my sashing. Um, I decided I auditioned quite a few different colors to do the little cornerstones, but kind of a cheery red was the direction I ended up going. Then I chose just a simple black solid as my outer border just to create that frame that finished off the edge and then went back to the black and white stripe just to have some fun with the binding portion. But what we're going to really focus on today is how to make these blocks. How do we create that that doesn't take a lot of measuring, a lot of thought, and we can have some fun as we're doing it. 
And I contemplated more than one technique because we could cut strips and angle the ends. We could do paper foundation, but I really hate taking the paper off afterwards. Um, so that I could make strip sets and cut pieces, all viable possibilities. But in the end, what I did was I cut squares of this light, what I call background, and then built uh, strips on top of that and trimmed it later because it made it easy and I didn't have to think very much. Didn't have to do quite as much measuring either. So that was the direction I went. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Okay. Do we have any? We're going to sit it back here kind of out of out of the, the place where we're going to work so we can reference it later. Um, do we have any? We have good morning from Gail from snowy Maine. Well, you're ta I'm talking to you from snowy Iowa. We got six inches the other day when they told us we were going to get two. So that's why I need some bright because everything's gray and white outside. And Pamela says she's watching from Royal Grand, California. So we have now spanned Maine to California. We've got the country awake. Perfect. And Teresa says, hi, from Rochester, New York. So we have some big cities. We have coast to coast. We're all together to work on our stash party project in our event today. So the pattern will tell you approximately, now when it comes to strips, you may want to make your quilt larger. So I put in an assortment of two inch strips. They could be two and a half also, but this one, I'm guess, I guess I'm actually using two inch strips, but you know, those binding strips we cut two and a half can be trimmed down to make them very nice and neat to two inch. So, um, you could make this bigger. You're going to need more of your strips. Just take out pieces. I know as soon as you pull them out, it seems like they multiply, kind of like bunny rabbits. So just kind of, you start messing them up and they get fluffy and there's a lot of pieces, but we're going to use up some of them. Okay. Then we're going to be cutting those background pieces at nine inches. We are going to trim them down at the very end of creating a block, but we're cutting them at nine. It's a pretty efficient way to use um, yardage. So if we're working, you know, we can get quite a few four inch strip uh, squares off a strip of fabric with the fabric. And that way we can have some fun on the building part portion. So I have my, here's my stripe, my red and cherry red and my white as my background. I'm going to set those out of the way, but we're going to work with these strips. So I have an assortment of strips. I went in and cut a variety I have a lot of fabric in my stash. I have a lot of, a lot more yellows than I thought I did. What I did when I was trying to figure out how do you organize this? And if you want to run an entire like rainbow kind of gamut is I went through and I cut some reds, I cut some greens, I cut some yellows and I sorted them by kind of color grouping. So that then when I was building my blocks, I could pick from different ones instead of because I tend to go to certain colors over and over. But if I had an assortment in front of me, it forced me to jump into, um, to select from different, different piles. So red and pink, of course, come from the same family. We've got our purples and we have our blues. Of course, that's my favorite pile always. But that way I knew that I had a nice selection of colors to go from. So my strips are all cut and ready. So I kind of have those piled up, ready to go. And you can pull up so many. You're going to end up realizing, oh, I can create like two baby quilts or three, three lap quilts once you get going on this process. But first, we're going to start with how do I, how do I position my strips on these squares so that I get it nice and neat? Because these are all cut at two inches, um, nice, neat two inch strips. Now you could do a variety of sizes. It would just be another look to the quilt. You could do, so you can do a variety of sizes if you wish. This one, I left it two inches so that I didn't waste anything and they were consistent and my blocks got done really quickly. So first thing we're gonna do is take that square of background fabric minus white and it's a solid white so I don't have a right or wrong side on it. But if you do, you're going to make this mark on the right side of the fabric. Most of us are thinking that's backwards. We always mark on the back usually for things. 
but we are going to be marking an align a line for us to line up our outer edge of our strip and i'll show you in just a minute usually we mark corner to corner we are going to push our ruler one quarter inch off of the diagonal and make a, a line there as a reference point for where to align our first strip. I'm just gonna mark it dark enough so that the camera can pick it up. Now you could use quick quarter, uh, quarter inch seam marker, anything if it's long enough. These weren't quite long enough. So if you're using smaller blocks, so I'm using a 14 inch ruler to get across the block, one quarter off that center, let me hold it up so you can tell. I'm going to just make a notation in the seam allowance where the actual diagonal would be. The actual diagonal would be, you know, point to point. I'm one quarter inch off of that to one side. And I made that reference line across my block. The reason why, that, why I'm doing that is that I'm going to take my first strip of fabric Let's see, I need at least like a 12 and a half to get, that's got some of those dot dots from my salvage. I do not want that in my block. I tend to be a person who doesn't trim away salvage until later. So making sure that the salvage doesn't end up in my block. I'm going to cut a piece that will go all the way across. And as I lay it down, now it's right, uh, right side facing at this point. Or no, I have to put it right side down. Listen to myself here. Right side together. The pattern does, does use that abbreviation, right side together, R-S-T. So right side of my first strip against the right side of my background. I'm aligning the cut edge on that, that line that we marked across the block. Then I'm going to grab, not usually a pinner, but I do want this to stay aligned nicely. So I'm taking just a couple of pins. And I tend to put my pins perpendicular to my stitching line. It's kind of a garment sewing uh, holdover, I think. Some people will align them parallel to the line so they don't have to take them out as they go. But I tend to put them perpendicular because my fabrics shift less that way holds it in, um, in place better. Now we're going to go back and we're going to sew using the outside edge, and just like you do with quarter inch seam, so that we're sewing along at the edge of the strip with our best quarter inch seam. Take the pins out as we approach them. Now I'm using a nice bright red thread so that when I take it out, you'll be able to see where I'm at. I can actually sew a nice straight seam for you today. Last one. The idea is that stitching line then will be on the diagonal. So when we take that out, get my board here so I can hold it up for you to see. My stitching line now is right there. And as I open that strip toward the other side and i'm gonna take this out so that i can use a hard surface and i tend to use my fingers to open up that seam all the way so i don't get a false stitch Oops, I get some raveling there but i want to open that seam all the way up so that it covers my seam allowance like this now Take it over to the iron, and you want to make sure that you do that ironing, pressing in between each step as you add strips. Otherwise, you get kind of a bubbling of these, and they don't lay flat. And then when you go back to quilt it, that bubbling can cause um, a pleat or a tuck to occur in your quilting process, and you want that to lay nice and flat. So opening that seam all the way up, Get our iron nice and hot. Let's see. Evelyn says, no snow here. Just waiting for flooding in the Central Valley of California. I, as I woke up this morning, I heard the coasts were having issues. 
more snow, nor'easter here and and uh, atmospheric river and flooding on the other side. I was like, oh, sad to hear. I hope everyone stays safe. Never drive through water that you can't can't tell where the bottom is, right? We have snowstorms in the Midwest too, uh, but the flooding in California has been pretty dramatic. And Lorraine says, it's afternoon. Hey, yay, thanks for joining us. We're glad that you could spend part of your little afternoon with us. And Brenda is watching from, ooh, Perth, Scotland. Fabulous. Love that you guys can join us from across the water. Okay, we have opened this seam up nice and we've pressed it all the way. So it's ready to put the next strip in place. So now that I've used from kind of the red pink pile, my next one, let's see, how about something bright and cheery yellow, okay? It's kind of golden color. We've got our strip ready to go. We have right sides together. Now we're using that, the, there's only one cut edge that's still um, free. We're gonna match the right side to right side. Put that across. Now you want that strip to be long enough to go all the way across your background piece. If it's too short, it, when we need it to trim later, we're going to have problems. So make sure that it extends just a bit beyond your background piece. And the background doesn't have to be white. It could be um, a fun gray color. If you were doing maybe a selection of all blues, how about a really dark midnight navy background and then do all blues on the other side? There's a possibility. So, um, the contrast is what you're looking for in this one. Something to let the, the strips kind of jump and speak. So you need a bit of a contrast there. Um, unless you're looking for a very soft contrast quilt, which is a possibility. I've seen beautiful quilts done in an array of just cream colors. Um, when I saw it, I thought of melted ice cream. It just was beautiful and soft. So there are times when a soft contrast works too, but in this one, I chose the stronger contrast so that all the strips would really pop out and be a little more playful. Okay, so we're sewing that second strip in place. Okay, and you can see as I open this up that this strip is not as long as the first. It does do kind of a stair-stepping thing on the outside edge, and that's okay. Um, also, make sure that you open that seam all the way up so that then you can take it to the pressing station and get that seam nice and warmed up so that it lays nice and flat. When we get in a hurry and we don't do that pressing portion is when we kind of get bubbles in the strips and... There is no way to press that out later because you're sewing it through a background or a base fabric. It would also be considered to be a foundation piecing. The fabric is a foundation. You can use things like, um, you know, paper foundations so that you're stitching through paper, which gets ripped away. This is going to stay intact, the fabric underneath there, throughout the duration of the use of the quilt. Okay, we need another fabric. Let's cut uh, a purple here so that we have, it will take four pieces to work our way across the block. So if you were to cut pieces in narrower strips, maybe you have you know, those leftovers you just, you don't want to throw away, you want to use somehow, you're welcome to do that. It means that though, if you use narrower strips, you're going to use five or more strips per block as you create these um, patchwork pieces. Four is what we'll cover um, when you're using two inch strips. So four per block. So if you want to divide up your colors or divide up your pieces, you know, a long, two mediums and a short, so that you know what's going into every single one, that would be a, a way to organize too. So everybody has a different way to organize or think through the process. But here we go, we've got strip number two. See our stair step going on, going back over to press. Okay, we've got a question from Jan. She asks, could you not cut the background at, um, out after the first strip if you don't 
have, so you don't have double layers. You could, um, that's a possibility that you could cut away if you'd like. This does create a little more stable block. Um, it would be an option. You could do that as long as you feel comfortable adding strips and making sure that it's going to be large enough. See, I'm using that base as my guide so that I know my strips are long enough to cover because later we're going to cut this out. And without that little triangle underneath right now, I wouldn't always know exactly where, how, you know, where to place it that's long enough. You would have to make them a little extra long. So just to guarantee you would have them centered properly. But if you'd like to try that, attempt it, see how it goes. There's always many ways to create these blocks and ideas. Let's see. Let's use, uh, let's see. I have a, a short green piece here right on top. Let's use the green to finish off. Do I have any shorter ones? No. Nope. Sometimes it's about wanting to use up the shortest pieces you have. Here is an orange, and he's got this funny cut. Must have been, I don't know why he's the shape, but let's use him on the end, okay? The last piece here. Do we have any other questions? This, um, let me sew this one on and see if we have any other questions that anyone has. If my bifocals would reach that far, I would try from here to read that, but that's not going to happen. Okay, this last little piece. Here we go. Bev asks, um, will the extra fabric make your block an uneven thickness? It does add a bit to the thickness, but when it's finished, you don't really notice the weight of it there. Um, we'll look at that, and I'll even show you what I use for backing because it's even a little bit, got some extra body to it also. But we've got our last piece on there. It was a concern when I started but once I got going on it, it didn't seem that it added that much more to it. So um, I didn't really have a concern that it was going to be too heavy or too stiff. And I'll show you how it feels. We'll, we'll try to transmit texture and feel through the camera as we finish, okay? Um, Chris uh, Chris has a question. How are, have, have you tried this with the batting and backing inside while you're sewing the strips. No, I haven't. I suppose you could, but you would still need batting on the other side. So, you know, putting batting underneath as you bat these strips sounds like a possibility, but you still would have need to have batting on this side. So I'm not sure that it would work quite the way that you intended or your thought. So Sometimes we have to step back and, and try to work through all the different steps that occur when we're making blocks and things. Sometimes there are a possibility and other times it's like, mm, but what if? So um, maybe rethink that one. Heather asks, could this be done as quilt as you go with batting another and another backing? Possibly. The quilt as you go technique is very valuable if you have a hard time quilting a large project as you, you know, in the machine after it's all assembled. And I understand that. And I have seen beautiful quilts done as quilts as you go. So I'm assuming that if you are creating quilt as you go blocks, you would have a backing fabric, a batting, and this on the top, and you would stitch through to create those. I don't see why that wouldn't be a possibility. Almost everything can be converted into quilts as you go. Um, so I'm assuming that that would work. You would just have to make sure that you um, pinned through because you're going to do all those rows of stitching, probably a walking foot in order to do that stitching so that everything was held in place. The batting doesn't shift later. So those who are really good at quilt as you go, they seem to be able to convert anything into quilt as you go. Um, techniques. So that's a possibility. Um, let's see. Did I miss anybody? I think that, I think that covers everybody that's up right now. Okay. So we have a block completed. You can see how ragged the two sides are. And in your pattern, it does say that the pieces will be, um, the blocks are then 
um, trimmed to eight and a half finished. So remember what size that is, because sometimes there are directions where people will say, well, trim to the size of the base. And I've done that before. But in this one, I wanted to be able to trim this down to eight and a half. So the math worked out for the size of the quilt that I wanted to create. So taking a square ruler or something that gets you to an eight and a half inch block, I am going to lay this out. Now, almost all rulers have that diagonal, the 45 degree line marked on them. And what you're going to want to do is put that 45 degree line on that diagonal of your block. And you're going to trim two sides at a time. Now, when I lay this on here, lining up that center, um, center seam between the background and my first strip and that diagonal line across the ruler, making sure that an eight and a half actually fits on there. It does. Then I'm going to trim two sides. So one, two, always cutting from a direction that's safe, never um, trying to use a ruler coming back toward you. Now I'm going to pick up the ruler. I'm not going to reorient the ruler. I'm going to twist my block underneath so that now I can put that diagonal line across the block again and I can line up the eight and a half inch marking with my block underneath. So the first two sides that I trimmed are now right underneath the eight and a half line. The diagonal across the ruler is on the seam between my first strip and my background. And then I'm going to clean up these two sides. It's always good to have a nice sharp blade in your rotary cutter. So if you haven't changed it lately and it's starting to skip threads, make sure maybe it's time to, you know, improve your blade, change it out. Now we have the eight and a half inch block completed like this. And you can see there's my stitching along the back, holding everything in place. Now, because that fabric is still behind there, it's kind of keeping these bias cuts because everything on these two sides now has a bias edge that has a little bit of stretch. And if you are at all worried about getting distorted pieces as you go to put them together later, that background fabric is holding everything stable so you don't get the distortion that can happen when you have bias edges there. So this might be a good double check for you if you're a person that tends to maybe stretch a little bit, get a little distortion when you're pressing. This is going to keep your blocks, your patchwork nice and tidy, okay? So then when you get into your pattern, your pattern then talks about arranging your strips with your little corner stones. So let's see. These aren't quite the right size, but I have a piece of leftover um, binding here that I'm just going to press flat so we can simulate what our strips look like. So as we put in the um, directions, it talks about laying out rows. Some people work vertically, some work horizontally. I tend to work in horizontal rows. Um, it never occurred to me that some people go other directions, but as I've met different quilters, um, there are some who like to work in vertical rows and that's okay too. It assembles the same way. So you're going to have a strip between blocks as you work your way across. So let's take out the quilt. You're going to work. Um, I work horizontal. So I've got a strip. Um, a block, Patrick block, a strip, a block, and I work and connect those all together. Now, when it comes to the pressing of those seam allowances, when you have seams that intersect with a continuous piece, of course, the seam allowances want to go toward the sashing bar. So let them go that direction. Then I assemble the um, cornerstone and the sashing that go between the rows. So a square, a, a rectangle, square, rectangle. And in that case, then, if you want opposing seams as you join things, if the seam allowances here are going towards the sash, the seam allowances here go toward the sash. That way, when you put these together, you have opposing seams and you get very nice intersections. 
it will keep you honest so that pieces um you know we talked about this having those bias edges on there on the outside of the block with that fabric underneath it keeps things nice and square so as you add your sashing pieces you won't get a distortion very often so that your patchwork blocks will stay the same size as your your sashing pieces so that's the um kind of a help and tip there so that everything will match up and you'll get nice intersections and points when you bring your pieces together. Now, this is one setting. So I have, whether or not you read it as the strips at the top or you read it this way, so the strips are in the bottom portion, doesn't matter. It, um, it's one direction. I did all of my blocks set the same direction. Now, in your pattern, if you haven't flipped all the way to the back portion of it, of course, I work in a program called EQ8. And in that program, you can rotate blocks and have all kinds of fun with settings. So the way I put mine together is just one option of many options of what you can create with just the same number of blocks that I did. So you can create something that looks like stars, um, an overall kind of square and a square kind of look. Um, there are just so many um, possibilities that you could play with. You could create an entire series of quilts like these. And these are this is using the same number of blocks. So I made um, 16 blocks. These are oriented with sashing. You could take the sashing out. It would be a little bit smaller quilt. Um, but here are some possibilities for settings. So you don't have to sit and try and draw all of them out of which one would I like to do. Then because I'm playing, um, I decided what, what if you want to make a larger quilt, approximately how much yardage would you like? So the very, uh, one of the last pages in your pattern that you've downloaded will give you um, options for two other sizes. So you would know how much sashing, how much border, um, how much binding, cornerstone fabric you would need in background squares. The number of strips then I just list as a large collection of or an assortment of because the yardage then can vary so greatly. So dig into those strips so that you can make your version of the stash party quilt that we have presented today. Let's see if we have some other. Um, Sheila asks, what difference would it make if you kept the block um, to nine inches? You can leave it at nine inches. It changes the math and the sashing, and it changes the overall um, size of your quilt. It just happened to be that I wanted to keep something that was um, about uh, like a baby quilt size, 47 and a half by 47 is what mine ended up to be. So if you wanted to leave them at nine inches, your quilt will just be a tad bit larger. Um, I tend to be a person who likes to a little bit oversize and then trim down to get that neat outer edge but you could trim it at nine, your option. Evelyn asks, um, it would be so cute to make one of the corners your label. Oh, that is a cool idea too. You could, because all of this space would give you a spot to create your label. Um, then she asks, I think I would, or she would talks about embroidering it before trimming the block down. That is, you could hand embroider it, you could hand ink it, you could machine embroider. If you're doing machine embroidery though, I have a friend who's done some machine embroidery and I've seen it done. I haven't done a lot of it myself, but you may want to leave that block, make that block oversized and then give yourself kind of a, a fabric marking line. So you stay within it because I know that hooping things, if you're doing machine embroidery, you do need enough fabric to hoop and stretch out that block so that you can center it properly. And the machine embroidery possibilities are absolutely endless. You can put things in and rotate and get them lined up just right. Um, I tend to like to ink things for um, labels, but that's a you know just a personal choice. Um, you could even use a leftover block on the back as a label and do how, however you want to finish it that way. Um, but the machine possibilities and hand embroidery, there's so many options. Okay. So now to get to the very end of the quilt, the binding, when using a stripe for a binding, I was linking my pieces together to create my binding. 
And we generally will join bindings together with diagonal seams like this. But lining up small stripes was kind of a headache. So I kind of went rogue and broke the rules. And when I decided to jo join my bindings end to end to go around, because I didn't want a disruption in the stripes, I went rogue and I actually put a straight seam and lined up the little stripes so that when I opened it, it was continuous and you can't find the seams. I know that this means that I had thickness where my seams join at, but in the end, you have to weigh, is it thickness that matters or the design? And for this reason, design one out. And I did not want to have a disruption in my seams. So now I have to find one to show you where I have to find a seam, of course. Now, because see the design element meant that, oh, here we go. There's a seam here. There's a seam right there between a black and a white stripe. But you cannot tell because I did end to end, so the stripe wouldn't be disrupted. So there are times when we go rogue, we do things that normally we would do a diagonal seam to join bindings so that we don't have very much thickness. But the only way I can find that is to run my fingers on, and it's just a tiny bit thicker there, but I don't disturb the design. So it's okay to go rogue once in a while and do things that normally we wouldn't do, okay? So stripes might be the time when you decide, I don't want that disruption. Now, when it came to the backing and how to quilt, because that's always the last step, everybody's like, well, what do I put on the back? Well, sometimes you go to the, your own stash. This is called the stash party, right? So I didn't want to buy any more fabric. So I went to my stash and I had a black and white plush fabric to put on the back. I had a couple other options. I had a red and white that I had picked up along the way. This happened to be a, the black and white and the black and white one on this one. So we have dots and stripes going on here. So that was the plush on the back. Yes, this quilt does have batting in it. It is a 70-30 blend um, cotton polyester, so it's not all cotton. A little less expensive than 100% cotton. But the thickness of the extra layer, I know a lot of you have concern, but it, seem, it doesn't really seem difference in thickness. And considering I have batting and a plush on the back, it is still soft and flexible. One of the reasons why it does stay soft and very um, pliable and drapeable is that I chose a very loose design for my quilting. There's a lot going on in this quilt with the stripes and the bright colors and stark black to white. I chose a medium gray thread. And yes, it can. It does show up on the black. On the gray, or the gray thread on the rest just kind of melts into the colors. Gray is one of those threads that tends to pick up and reflect the color around it. So as the gray runs through the orange, I don't really see it. When it runs through the blue, it just kind of disappears. When it goes through the stripe, it doesn't disturb the, the line and your eye. So you don't see, like, if it was black, it would really break up the stripe a lot. But gray tends to be one of those neutrals that can kind of fade into the background, holds the layers together. But I use a fairly loose um, stitching on this because once you get dense, close together stitching, things get very stiff, very, um, that loses its flexibility. And I wanted this to be a cuddly kind of quilt. So it crushes and it doesn't feel thick in those areas whatsoever. So the possibilities are pretty endless. Have fun with your stash. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, what do I use to ink my labels? That is a very, very good question. I'm trying to see if I have one of my pens here and I do not. Um, I usually use a 0.05 tip Pigma pen. Um, there are different companies that make them. They're archival safe so that there aren't any acids in the inks that will affect the fabrics as you put it directly on there. 
we do have a video of making labels. So I'm hoping that my, my admin who's helping me right now, I'm gonna make him scramble and find the link to um, making labels for quilts. And I think maybe we did one on a live event even last year doing um, doing labels using, um, I usually tend to, to do inking for my labels. I know that I am have a tendency to misspell things. So I tend to write things out on paper first, get it aligned or print it on a computer with larger size type. Then I will lay it on a light board, take it to the window, um, put my fabric over the top and um, then trace the printed message because I've tried to do it just winging it, thinking, I know how to spell. Yes, I know how to spell, but sometimes the letters don't always come out in the right order. So um, by printing off the label onto paper and then tracing it, I tend to have better luck. And people will say, well, you printed it on your computer. And they're like, no, I'm just really good at tracing this. So I pick a very simple, larger type style than you normally would think of so that it's easy to trace and very legible that 0.05 Figma pen, um, different companies make them. I found some Porter used to make some. Um, I'm trying to remember what some of the other or tan colored pen, and I don't happen to have one right in front of me right now, but something that's ar archival safe on fabric to trace if you're going to trace a label. So this guy hasn't gotten his label yet. Hmm. Back to taking my scraps and making a label this afternoon, I suppose. Thanks for asking that question. It's really a good one. Um, label, uh, Rebecca asks, do you put the label on the flush fabric on the back or on the cotton on the front? Uh, I tend to usually always put my label on the backs into a corner. When you open up the quilt, if it has a right side or, or a, a top or a bottom, I will turn the quilt over at the bottom right hand corner. This one really doesn't have a, a right side, a top or a bottom, but on the back side of one corner, and I tend to bring it down into the corner. And depending on how much I want to put on the label, they tend to be somewhere around four by six. You can make them smaller, you can make them larger. Depends on what kind of information you would want to include, or if you have a special message for the recipient of the quilt. Um, I tend to border out my little white, I use a something background kind of color. So what I will probably do is use a piece of white and I tend to put a little border around my, or frame around my border or my label. So I'll probably frame it something like this with a black and white edge all the way around and then do the um, inking on the center and then bring it to the back side of my quilt and hand stitch it with small stitches the same way you would finish your binding on the back of the quilt. You can put labels on the front if you like. Some people like to just make a very, very small label um, and put it into, I'll see if I can find a piece of fabric that I can use as a simulation here. Some people just want to put simply their name in a little tag kind of thing. And by sewing a little label similar to the tag in the back of your shirt or um, a garment, they would finish the edges, but they might make just a little tiny tag like this and put it under the binding as they finish. And so it's just a little flap with their name on it and maybe a year. That's another way to label a quilt. So possibilities when it comes to labeling, your choice, your quilt. Um, Gail says, thank you. I have a new niece and I purchased a jelly roll, but had no idea on the blocks. Now I do. Mm, congratulations on the new niece. She will absolutely love your quilt. Um, let's see. I think, oh, we have one other question from Karen. She asks, could you just use a stitch in the ditch for the strips and, and the circumference, the outer edge of the block, and then use small designs of toys or animals in the white triangles? Oh, that would be absolutely the cutest idea ever. Yes, you could very easily do stitch in the ditch or just stitch a quarter inch from each of the of the um, seam lines. That would be enough to hold it in place. And if you could create little characters in here, I wish I had that kind of artistic ability, <laughs> but, but that would be a fabulous way to create a really unique gift. 
you guys have so many ideas. Sometimes I get off from doing these live events and then I have like ideas for five more quilts. But now I need the time to make them all. So thanks for joining me today. We are in National Craft Month. We are bringing you wonderful ideas of things to keep you busy. Jot them down, put them on your bucket list. The stash party has begun.